Welcome everybody to another History Talks. Today we have Lori Egan Hitley from the Verona Cultural Center and Museum to talk today. Um, so give her a round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm not native. I'm just a, a white girl that uh, <laughs> works in a museum. Um, but my background is in anthropology and museum studies and uh, I love what I do. And I feel like I'm one of those people that can honestly say I've never worked a day in my life. Uh, I love working in Barona. Uh, the people are wonderful, and if I can share that with you, then I've, I've done my job. Um, but we will start at the beginning. So this, this funny word is ipai. And this apostrophe is actually a sound in their language that we don't have in English. And it's like, uh, oh, oh. So everybody do that with me. <laughs> so it's a sound that goes before e pi. So e pi, e pi, and that means people. So back before there was anybody else here, there were just the people, and that was their name for themselves. They only had to distinguish. Hey, actually, they only had to distinguish between dialects. So if you were e pi, you were kind of the northern dialect, northern people. And if you were Teapai, you were the southern people. But it's like going to England, say, and asking for a shopping trolley, right? It's the same thing. We understand it's a shopping cart or a basket, right? So they can understand each other. Um, but they were just uh, separated by what is now the 8 freeway. You know, it's called the Kumeyaay Highway. Uh, for a reason, that was an old Kumeyaay Trail. And so north of the 8 is Teapai, and south of the 8 is Teapai. So Barone is north of the 8, and so we focus on the Ipai people. Later terms that you probably know are Degeno. That was the name that the Spanish gave them. Uh, now they're known, a lot of them are known as Kumiai people. That's a later term that they've used to kind of band together and create a nation, right? Um, it's important for them not to act as there's 12, 12 bands uh, of Kumiai people. And it's important to act as a group, not as individual bands. And so kumyai is a unifying term. Um, but there are still people that if you call them kumyai, they will be very upset. There are people, if you call them digeño, they will be very upset. Uh, so there's lots of terms uh, bantered about. So I just want to share that with you. And uh, don't be confused as we go if I use ipai, tipai, digeño, kumyai, uh, Indian, Native American. Okay, so those are all part of, um, part of what I'm going to be talking about. So we're going to start at creation. Um, I do ask that you kind of remove your Western lens uh, and kind of go on this journey with me, um, standing in the people's shoes and the ancestors' shoes. Uh, that's a, one way to really learn about the people and appreciate what, uh, what their culture and rich heritage is all about. Uh, a lot of times we'll ask people, what was it like before 1769? <laughs> what, what do you mean? What was before 1769? There, really? What? So, you know, for a lot of us, you know, we pick up a book and, and San Diego begins in 1769, right? We just had the big 250th anniversary. Uh, I'll have a story about that later. Um, so it's important that, you know, we as a group, as San Diegans, acknowledge that there was something before, right? And that isn't often uh, recorded in history books, and it's not really talked about in school. And so this is where the museum comes in, and this is um, why I'm here tonight. So if you'll indulge me. Here we go. This is creation. Uh, this is like a little quick version of their story of creation. And actually, their story took four days and four nights to tell. And they would sing their, their stories. And it was very important that um, people of all ages were there. And this is how you taught the next generation your stories, your beliefs, your philosophies. It was sung. You might have heard of uh, bird singing. There's all kinds of singing, not just bird. Um, but this is how stories were told. And this is the very quick version, and I'm not doing it justice at all. Uh, in the beginning, there was nothing but water. And there were two brothers that lived near the water. And they wanted to go to the surface. 
and one followed the other, and the older brother went first and kept his eyes closed. It was the ocean, it was salt water, and kept his eyes closed until he got to the surface, and the younger brother called up and said, hey, how did you get up there? Did, did, do I open my eyes? And he said, yeah, open your eyes. So he swam up to the surface, and his eyes burned from all the salt. So then he was blinded by the time he got up, and so you have these um, dueling creators, right? And there's animosity, and there's issues. The older brother is, is better, and he does things better, and the younger brother that is now blinded uh, tries very hard and tries to learn, but it's just not quite right. And this is how their stories are told. There's always somebody teaching uh, somebody else, and these are philosophies. The, the, you know, the people who are being told this story should, should learn. So the, these brothers place the sun, and they place the moon, and they create all the animals, and they create the people. And then uh, they're enjoying their creation, and the younger brother says, okay, you know, creation is done. I'm going back into the ocean. I'll be there if you need me. And the, the older creator, the older brother, hangs around, and he watches all, all of his creation, and he's very happy with himself and all that's going on. But he realizes that uh, there's not enough resources for all the people. And he gives the people uh, three choices. You can live forever. You can die and come back after resources are replenished. Or you can live a short while and die and never come back. And the people just didn't know what to do with this choice. Right? They, they couldn't figure it out. And so, at this time, people and animals were the same. They could talk to each other. So they hold this big, big meeting, big council, and they were talking about, what should we do? Should we do that? Should we do that? What's happening? And the fly said, what are you guys doing? This is ridiculous. Just die. Just die. You know, don't worry about it. Live here for a little while. Do what you have to do, and then die. And they said, okay, we decide that. So, now... You know, we think about, was that the best choice? Um, but that's what was decided, and that's why we live for a short while, and then we die forever. We don't get to come back. And that's why Fly continually rubs his hands. If you see him, he's rubbing his hands in forgiveness. He's sorry that he made that decision on behalf of the people. So they made that decision. They're living. And Frog... Uh, did not like the way she was created. She was angry at the creator for making her so ugly. Uh, she was not happy, and she set out to get revenge. And she poisoned the water that the creator drank, and he was soon going to die. He knew it. He was all-knowing. He knew. So he told the people, you need to prepare for my death. I am leaving, and you guys need to do these things. So you see in the far picture there, <clears throat> they're cremating him, and they're, they're learning now this, this ritual, this ceremony that they have, their customs and traditions. They're circling the body and singing and sending him on his farewell journey. But Coyote wanted to be the next leader, and he was so gluttonous and so conniving. Uh, he was plotting all along how he could be the next creator, and he said, well, if I steal the creator's heart, I have to be the next leader. And the people and the animals were telling Kai, oh, hey, go over there, get firewood, go over there, you know, go, we need you to go over there. They kept shooing him away. Um, but Coyote kept coming back, and he jumped over this circle of people, circle of animals. He jumped over Badger, who was the shortest man, jumped over, grabbed the creator's heart, and ran away, and thinking he'd be the next creator, and that just didn't happen. But we have tribal members tell us, um, you know, if you ever hear a coyote cry, uh, he, he burned his mouth with the heat of the heart and he says, ow, oh, ow, oh, ow, oh, ow, oh. ow. <laughs> but uh, their belief is that when he's running away with the heart and it's dripping blood, that is where clay comes from. Those are clay deposits in the earth. So they've cremated their creator, and now the people are left to exist, and it's difficult. They don't have a creator to go to. They don't have all the information they need. They're left kind of going, what now, what now? So they remember that the younger brother had gone back to the ocean, and so they send their fastest runner, and it was Sandhill Crane. And he runs to the ocean, 
and they had been taught that there's there's monsters, there's sea monsters. And so he was worried about going into the ocean, so he turned himself into sea foam and floated across the ocean to where the creator lived, and he called the creator, the creator came up and said, all right, prepare a house for me, I'll be there in, in a couple days. So he runs back to the people and says, okay, he's coming, let's get ready, let's build him a house. So here's a house, that's called an awa. It's a willow brush hut, sometimes it's made out of tule. Uh, so they built this house, and next thing they know, they see the creator coming. And he has taken the form of a winged serpent, a uh, snake, and he's coming through. And it's a long journey, he's very big. So he actually rests upon this rock, and this is a rock in uh, a wea pipe reservation. And you can see it's leaning, a wea pipe is the Indian word for leaning rock. So the creator uh, is resting here and he pushes this rock over on his way to the people. So that's a very important rock there. And he gets there and he's so big, he fills up the house. And they say, oh my gosh, he's so big, we have to make it bigger. So they make the house bigger. Oh my gosh, he's still too big. He's coiling himself inside this house. Still too small. They build it, build it, build it, build it. Big house, he's coiling inside and people get scared. He's so massive and somehow accidentally catches fire and the creator is cremate, uh, cremated. <laughs> but his, his body explodes in the heat and all of the bits of his body fall into the people's mouths and they ingest him. And with that comes the knowledge they need to live on this land. So if we were there, you would have gotten a different piece, you would have gotten a different piece. We all had different pieces, different bits of knowledge and then we go our separate ways, live our lives, and then we come together every so often to share our knowledge and pass it on, and then we go away. And that still happens today. They still have these annual gatherings where people gather, share their songs, share the stories. Um, and so that's why you have specialized roles in the community. You know, your family got one, one part of the, the story, your family got another part of the story, and it's important to come together. It's a quick version. That's a four-day story right there. <laughs> So this map might look familiar. It's, um, uh, we've used it quite a bit. This is uh, flexible territories, but uh, territory boundaries. But this is about what the ancestral territory looked like. You can see uh, the international border here bisecting what was originally their territory. It's usually uh, bound by water, watersheds. Uh, and then these were flexible borders because there was always a lot of uh, marriage and kinship ties to the people on the other side. It was important to have good relations and so the, the daughters would marry and move into the husband's families. So these, these were fluid borders. You can see how it is now. So here's Verona, right there. And I mean if you look at the at time, how much it's uh, been diminished. So they had access to four, if not more, ecological zones within their territory. So there's coastal resources, uh, valley resources, mountain resources, desert resources, and they weren't just aimlessly wandering about. Right? Oh my gosh, there's a bighorn sheep, let's go over there. No, it wasn't like that, right? It was calculated. They had all this knowledge from their creator, they knew when it was time to move. They watched the stars and the heavens. They knew when the solstices took place and the equinoxes. They knew. So, where do you think they lived in the summertime? What zone? Yeah, don't we all want to go to the beach in the summer, right? So it was a great time to be at the coast. There, we, now there's lots of fish out there, you know. We, if any of you guys are tuna fishermen, when's the tuna run? I'll see you in August out there at the boats, right? Go out here into the Mexican waters and get tuna. It's wonderful. They knew about that. When did the Brennan run? Right now. So they knew that. And the thing is, they were scientists before Western science was here. They knew that those Brennan would send scouts. And they beach themselves to look around and make sure it's safe. And then they go back in the water and say, okay, guys, it's safe right here. Let's go. Let's beach ourselves. And that's when the native people would gather them. They knew that if they gathered the scouts, no more fish would be coming up. 
And so that's why now, if you look at the Grunion schedule, there's only certain times that you can collect them and be out there and not bother them because those are scouts and they're laying the babies. And Anyway, um, the native people knew that. So where do you think that they would be in the fall? In the mountains. In the mountains, there's a, a huge resource in the mountains. What is it? Acorns. Acorns. That was their sustenance year-round. They could harvest enough acorns in the fall to last them all year. And that's what they had in times of need. Uh, they had enough uh, protein from acorns to exist. So it was important to be up in the mountains about where Barona is. There's tons of oak groves, and they had managed oak groves. They took care of those plants. Um, they would collect enough, grind them up, save them in granary baskets uh, made of willow. Willow uh, has natural properties um, and bugs don't like willow. So their acorns were safe in this big huge willow basket. Uh, again, because they were scientists, uh, they knew that willow has that chemical salicin, which is like what Tylenol and Bayer and uh, Advil all learned later. All right, so they had all this knowledge of ethnobotany and with whatever zone they were in, they could find all the resources they needed. So the valley, uh, where, when would they be in the valley, do you think? Along what is now uh, Mission Valley, the river? When would Spring. they be there? Spring, right? Because the snow's melting, the water's coming through. Um, that's where they would harvest their clay, it grows along the water's edge. That's when they would have their gardens. They were gardeners. Uh, they were seed savers. They knew how to uh, broadcast agriculture and terrace agriculture. They knew all those things. And then when would they move out to the summer if they had to? Winter. Desert. Yeah. So they'd be out in the winter. And you know, a lot of resources, not necessarily in this portion of the territory, but beyond. But they all spoke um, the same language stock, and so they could communicate. Uh, for instance, obsidian. Obsidian is a great resource that everybody needed to make arrow points, projectile points, spear points, etc. There's no volcano in their territory. So how'd they get it? They had to trade, right? They could trade in Northern California, they'd go down to Mexico, out here in Obsidian Buttes. So that was why you had these friendly ties to your neighbors, because you had to trade with them. And what did they trade? Shells, right? Because they had all these resources at the coast. They could be like, I have my abalone up here. It could be a bowl. If it breaks, you can make it into jewelry. It can be, uh, I have a scallop shell up there. That's a good scraper to scrape fiber from the yucca leaves. Uh, you can scrape deer hides with it. You can scrape rabbit hides with, you know. Shells are important. It's also a sign of status. So you can see, I hope, that this old notion of hunter and gather subsistence, uh, everything that the anthropologists have written in a book, is not quite right. It wasn't ambiguous, it wasn't they were aimlessly wandering around, they had a plan and they followed it, and this was all knowledge from their creator. So here's a rendering, uh, one of the earliest renderings of what a um, home site might have looked like. So you see the awa. The awa is only for sleeping. It was only for night. They'd have a fire in there. They'd have these beautiful tule mats and rabbit skin blankets and um, stay warm. They did all of their work in these shade structures, which now it's a Spanish word called ramada. So they worked under the ramadas, and maybe they were drying skins or drying fish or drying meat. Uh, we don't use the word village anymore. We don't talk about them as having a village. If you look up uh, the Latin word for village and look at the root of the word, it talks about people living together with a church uh, centrally located. So people gathered and living around a church. That's just not true here. So we don't use the word village. Um, a long, for a long time, the textbooks, the anthropologists tell us that people have been here for about 10,000 years. Sometimes they can push it back to 40,000 years. This is a point, a spear point that we have in the collection that dates back to 10,000 years. So the archaeological record gives us 10 to 40,000 years. Beyond that, things don't exist. They just didn't make it. They don't survive. However, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard about the 
Supreme Court ruling and the proceedings with NAGPRA and uh, anything like that in 2016. Um, the scientists have human remains from La Jolla um, and they have always said that this was an older culture, a culture that predates the Kumeyaay people. So I just got through telling you that they've been here since the time of creation. Mm -hmm. And they have stories about that. They have songs about that. And these have all been handed down. But scientists are saying, no, no, these aren't your people. You're not related to them. We're going to study these remains. We want to do DNA testing on these remains. And because you can't prove it, you can't prove that these are your ancestors, we don't have to give them back to you uh, under the, the law, the NACRA federal law. Went all the way to the, to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court threw it out, saying they're their they're their most likely descendants. Give them the remains back. So what that uh, effectively does is turn the field of anthropology on its ear, and now all these paradigms and these careers that people have built have been thrown out of the water. Um, so it's interesting. I don't know if any of you have been to the Natural History Museum. They have that Ceruti Mastodon on display mm -hmm. yeah. with evidence of human butchering. Mm -hmm. And how old is that? Like 130,000 years. 130, years, right? Mm -hmm. They know that there have been humans here since the late Pleist since the end of the Pleistocene. Mm -hmm. And now the Kumeyaay people can claim that those are the, their ancestors. So that's pretty, pretty wonderful. So this is a mural we have in our museum, and we, we use it a lot to show the kids what life would have been like before contact. Uh, a lot of this is, um, you know, kids just don't know how to relate to it. They don't understand what contact means, and, you know, we have to start at the beginning. So this shows uh, uh, what life would have been like probably in the Barona area and that was part of their territory. The women uh, doing the domestic chores, raising kids, finding daily food, preparing daily food. Uh, the men would be off on hunting parties for bigger game, bigger pieces of protein, uh, providing for their family. And how does life continue for tens of thousands of years this way? It's because they're handing it down to their children. So you always see uh, family groups, um, men talking to boys, women talking to girls, and they're, this is, really small, and I'm sorry, but, you know, they didn't have school, they didn't learn their history from books, they didn't learn their skills from books. Here's a couple guys playing a game that we call a Palomar. Does that sound like a word you might know? Palomar? So this is, uh, in English, hoop and pole, right? So this guy's rolling this hoop, and this guy has a spear in his hand, and he's trying to throw it through this rolling hoop. So this is target practice, right? They're learning how to hunt so they can be effective when they go on these big hunting parties with the men. A Palomar means winning arrow. So there's a story that there was a battle on Palomar Mountain and they won. And so they had the winning arrow and they called that site a Palomar. Um, and then today we say Palomar. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, yeah. And then what happened? So contact happened. And um, this is not always an easy story to talk about, right? Um, a lot of people want to believe that the, the missions uh, were kind and saved the neophytes and, and did all these wonderful things. But the truth is that people were taken there under duress. They have what could be 130,000 years of existence uh, here in this place. They had all the knowledge they needed to be successful. It was idyllic until 1769. Everything changed. And then after uh, Mexican uh, rule came in, they weren't really rocking the boat. They maintained the status quo. The people were still under duress, subjugated to work on these, these big land grant, these ranchos. And um, you can imagine over this time, how much of their culture and heritage was lost. Um, there's writings um, by the priests in the, in the missions that talk about how all oh, the Indians have embraced this. They're, look at them celebrating with us. But what they were doing was practicing this religious syncretism. On the feast days, if anybody's Catholic, uh, 
there's these feast days and there's a fiesta and the church celebrates and there's food and fun and games and um, so they would take advantage of these feast days to practice their own ceremonies and keep them alive as much as they could. So they were practicing both and that's why we still have a lot of ceremonies today because they were able to hold on to them under the guise of being, being good, good Catholics. So, uh, after Mexican rule, uh, I showed you the territory with that the border came in and California became a state in 1850. You guys have all heard the story about Manifest Destiny. The, the Americans were moving west, pushing people off the land. It was sometimes very violent. Um, but here in California, it's a different history. Instead of people moving west, people were coming south from the north. The gold rush, people were coming from the north. So a lot of folks will say that um, the Kumeyaay people were not as bothered by that. They didn't make it that far down, and that's, that's slightly true. But the effects of the attempted genocide and assimilation were felt here. So... If you haven't read these books, I would uh, recommend them to you. Uh, a Murder State talks about genocide in California, and An American Genocide talks about all the genocide attempts uh, in the United States. We had uh, Benjamin Madley, the author of An American Genocide, out, and I, I, I credit him with this. If everybody could stick their hand out, all right, and if your shoulder is the, the beginning of creation, right? Here at the very beginning. They, the people, lived all this time, all this time, without any interruption. They knew what they were doing uh, until your middle finger, the tip of your middle finger, where your nail starts to grow away from your skin and it's white. That little tip of white represents the last 250 years. And in that 250 years, almost complete decimation of their culture. So it's a very interesting book. Uh, I'd encourage you to read it. Um, a lot of people push back, oh, there was no genocide, it didn't happen like that. Uh, I would encourage you to also look up Lincoln's uh, definition of genocide, you know, after World War II. Uh, were they willingly killing members of the population? Yes. Were they willingly taking babies away from their parents? Yes. Um, so if you look at those five or six factors, uh, definition of genocide, it fits the bill. So what happened? Uh, they, a lot of people moved to San Diego. It's a great place to be. Um, but the Indians were in the way. And they uh, largely were what we call pushed into the rocks. They were pushed out what we now call East County and beyond because this is where people wanted to be. They were no, allowed, no longer allowed to be here in downtown around, uh, they had to go live where nobody else wanted to live. And what did that look like? So here's this rocky hillside. This is it, um, Capitan Grande. Look at these folks, you know, they're trying to make a living, trying to exist in this year round, right? We talked about this being good for the fall to collect acorns, but imagine being up here in the winter. It could snow, rain, uh, in the summer, it's hot. Right? So this is not an ideal place to be, and they no longer have use of their whole territory. It's rough. Over here, uh, they're living in now what is adobe structures. They learned that from <coughs> newcomers. They learned about Western dress from the newcomers, and yet they are still pounding acorns for subsistence. Right? So they've had all these influences, and yet they are still having to live very traditionally without the, the, um, the use of their whole territory. For resources. So I want to read just a little bit, and I hate reading because reading is boring, but um, in 1850 there was an act for the government protection of Indians and it provided the following. The justice of the peace would have jurisdiction over all complaints between Indians and whites, but in no case shall a white man be convicted of any offense upon the testimony of an Indian or Indians. Landowners would permit Indians who are peaceably residing on their land to continue to do so. Whites would be able to obtain control of Indian children. If any Indian was convicted of a crime, any white person could come before the court and contract for the Indian services, and in return would pay the Indians fine. It would be illegal to sell or administer alcohol to Indians. 
Uh, Indians convicted of stealing a horse or any other valuable could receive any number of lashes and fines of $200. However, for whites, uh, it was no more than a $10 fine. And finally, if you were Indian and found strolling, loitering, or begging, or generally being in town, you were liable for arrest. The justice, mayor, or recorder would make a warrant, and within 24 hours, the services of the Indian in question could be sold to the highest bidder. The term of service would not exceed four months. So you can see why they preferred this, right? If they were in town, it's not good. So that's in 1850, that's where people were kind of uh, clamoring for land and, and staking their, their claim here in San Diego. In 1851, the government sent out uh, folks to make treaties, right? Because they had done this all the way moving west. Make treaties with these people, take their land. Move west, make treaties with these people, move west. Keep going, keep going. Well, now they're here, they're in California, they can't go very much further. So they uh, make treaties with the people and it turns out those treaties were taken back to D.C. and they were never ratified. So you guys have heard of those unratified treaties? That they were unearthed like in 1905, you know, some 50 years later. And what that means is, make a long story short, is the people never ceded their land. So when you hear the folks, you know, if they're up in arms, this is, you're on stolen land. It was stolen, right? They didn't give it up. They thought that the treaties were signed. Nobody ever came back and said, we're not signing them, by the way. Um, so their, their land is stolen. Uh, in 1853, uh, you guys have probably heard of uh, John Magruder. He wanted asylum for these people. He had a little bit of a heart. And he uh, issued a federal permit for them to live here uh, without being hassled. And then in 1875, President Grant uh, established their reservation, the Capitan Grande uh, Reservation. And so that meant they could live here uh, and enjoy some amount of sovereignty. And uh, sovereignty here in the United States isn't quite uh, exactly what it is elsewhere. Uh, they're still wards of the government. Uh, the land is not truly theirs, uh, but they're allowed to live and provide for themselves. So uh, you can see uh, up to modern times it's not super great. Uh, here is pictures of life at Capitan Grande. Uh, again, they're wearing Western clothes. Uh, this was the school teacher that the, the government sent to educate them. And again, there's all these um, subtle uh, moves of assimilation, right? Because if the people can, are educated, they can go get jobs, they don't have to live on the reservation, they will go, they will disperse, and there will be no more, and I quote, Indian problem. The government referred to it as an Indian problem. So they're doing all they can to make Indians uh, assimilate. So you can see, you know, the kids have to go to school, <coughs> doing their best, I'm sure. And you've heard of um, the Dawes Act in 1887. That's where the federal government says, all right, uh, you guys all, you, you can no longer have this trust land. You are going to get uh, an allotment. And you are going to be just like everybody else in the United States and work your land and be responsible for your land. And if you have to sell it because you're broke, so be it. So that's another attempt at assimilation. And then again, I mentioned 1905, uh, the word came out that, oh, this is more ratified, huh? So they, they were living up in El Capitan, uh, Capitan Grande Reservation, doing what they could. A lot of them worked as ranch hands on the ranches. Uh, they were going to school. They were becoming educated. They were doing what they could to make ends meet. And in 1919, uh, Ownership of reservations wasn't happening. Uh, they were granted citizenship, uh, but were still considered wards of the government. Uh, in 1924, so uh, you guys know what's happening down here in San Diego, all these throngs of people are coming here. There's not enough water. Uh, there's a, uh, an act of Congress, the Captain Act, that says, oh, 
we're going to build a reservoir up there in the mountains so that we can bring fresh water to San Diego. Okay, great. Well, who's living up there? So, uh, you know, they go up to the Indians and they say, hey, we need water. You're on the land, so you guys have to go. And they said no. And they said, oh, now what are we going to do? Okay, now you have to really go, I'm going to give you money. So each of you are going to get some money to leave, okay? Yeah? Good? Go. And uh, the full expectation of the government was that they would take their money, go, buy a house in town, go to work in town, and then guess what? No more Indian problem, right? They didn't have to worry about this reservation status anymore. They didn't have to worry about the Indian problem anymore. These people would be gone, and no more Indians would ever exist. But because the creator had given the people their knowledge, uh, they knew what, what it meant to stay together and take care of each other. They pooled their money and purchased Rancho Barona. And went back to the government and said, okay, we want our federal status, we want our sovereign status back, and I want, we want you to make Barona a reservation. And the government had egg on their face. They didn't anticipate that at all. So uh, they, woo, come back. So they purchased Barona in 1932. So this is after almost 20 years of negotiating with the, uh, the people who, you know, all the water rights, Fletcher, you know, dams, and all of this stuff was happening. And finally, in 1932, they purchased Barona, and they needed to move. This is what Barona looked like in 1932. It was a working ranch. A lot of them had worked there already. They felt comfortable moving there. They felt like they could work the land and take care of the cattle. And uh, This is Ramon, Ramon Ames. Uh, this is the first time they're calling people chief, right? That's a stereotype we don't really use, but he was in charge. Because he was educated, he could three, speak three different languages, and he could communicate to the people and be the middleman for the government. So he really brokered this deal for Barona and was, was the guy that made it all happen. And the first thing they had to do was move their cemetery. Um, so if you... If you think back, right, they had become uh, Catholics, and so they were practicing Catholicism. They had a church in Capitan. They had a cemetery in Capitan. Um, it wasn't until Vatican II, which I believe began in 1962, uh, that the church said you could cremate your, your loved ones. So they had been burying. Remember, the, the, the creator told them they needed to cremate bodies. The church says don't cremate bodies, bury them, because the body is uh, so sacred. So they had to unearth all of their graves and bring them to Barona. And to do that, um, they had to consecrate the ground. So they needed to build a church in Barona. That was the first building built. And move their dead, establish a new cemetery, and then they could build all their houses. So you guys, I'm sure, know about Irving Gill, architect. Uh, he was living in Vista uh, towards the end of his life. He had already had a heart attack. Uh, Arts and crafts was out the window. They were on to bigger and better things. Uh, the government hired an urban planner, right? They had egg on their face. They thought, okay, now we have to make this a really model reservation, safe face. Uh, we're going we're gonna to do it right. So they, they send this urban planner to San Diego and... Uh, you know, he's going around to the architect saying, hey, do you want to work out and help us build these homes for these people? No. Do you? No. Do you? No. Who, who's out here? Who can do it? Oh, go ask Irving Gill. He'll do it. So sure enough, Gill says, yes, this is what I've been waiting for my whole life. Uh, you know, he wanted to build these homes for the everyman. You know, he had those uh, models in Sherman Heights and his... You know, even though he's building the Marston House and all of these other beautiful places, he really was wanting to build homes for the everyman. He wanted them to be um, simple, easy to keep clean, cheap to repair. So this was his last commission. He worked out of Barona. He won the bid. Uh, he was paid $500 to design the residences. He threw the church in for free. And not only that, he moved to Barona and lived on site to help the Indians build it. Um, so, here's the church, Gill's church. You can see them building it. Here's the inside. 
And these are the brand new homes at Barona's. First time they're living in a modern home, running water, bathrooms, hot water. Uh, so there's laying the pipe, uh, tribal members in front of their new home, kitchen sink. You know, Gil was so particular about how he lived in his homes. He took uh, a bunch of the ladies to apartments he had built in La Jolla and said, look, this is, you need a chair, you need these tables, you need these curtains, you need this rug. <laughs> so they ended up buying in bulk all the furnishings for the house. Uh, the Kuros had the first ice box on the reservation, you know, so they're all very, very pleased. If you've been to the Marston house, this is the same kind of tub, cloth hood tub encased in magnesite. Right, the back bathroom by Arthur's room. Exactly, this was Gil's doing. All right, so since they moved, where are they? In 1948, very progressive, they had their first female chairwoman. They've had two chairwomen. Uh, this first one, she uh, held office for over 20 years. Uh, 1982, they won a Supreme Court ruling and allowed them to have high stakes bingo. Catholic, right? We played bingo. <laughs> uh, in 1994, uh, they are the first themed casino on Indian land with the first Las Vegas style buffet, right? So that draws all the crowds. Uh, in 2000, California voters approved Prop 1A, saying that they could have slot machines and uh, card games. And then, so they were they're experiencing some success, and a lot of that money. Uh, was going back to tribal members and they have what they call this um, sharing so the the non-gaming tribes they would help out all right they're all related it's family and we were able to open the museum so we're celebrating our 20th anniversary this year uh, it was important for them to be able to walk into worlds right uh, they don't want to lose any more culture what was left needed to be preserved the museum is very important we have all that tangible culture you know those those artifacts um, while well, they continue to be progressive and maintain their sovereignty and provide for them themselves. Uh, and then it's, it's morphed over the years, uh, the Barona Valley Ranch Resort, now it's Barona Resort, and they just did a, a big expansion last year. Um, but what does it mean? It means financial and political sovereignty, self-sufficiency. They can retain their customs while staying modern people. Uh, it's allowed the museum to be uh, front runners in language preservation. We have a 700-page dictionary if you're interested. Uh, you know, the, the elders have places of honor, right? This is all going back to their tradition and what they've been taught. Uh, every child has the opportunity to go to college free. Uh, we have a state-of-the-art fire station, paramedics right across the street from the museum, takes care of the reservation and beyond our neighbors up there on the hill. And uh, because the casino industry is so big, it really contributes to a lot of jobs. Uh, and tourism. Although, uh, I should put in here, uh, 1976 was the Religious Freedom Act. They could finally start practicing their religious uh, customs and traditions legally. 1976. Uh, so here at the museum, a lot of what we do is try to keep this, na this knowledge alive. We have a, a, a native plant garden and we do a lot of work with ethnobotany. Uh, this is a recent picture. We do um, plant journals. You can come learn about all of the medicine plants, the basketry plants, uh, and learn their Ipai Ah name, their native name, their English name, their Latin name, and how they were used. You get a plant sample, you make a drawing, you keep your little ethnobotany journal. Uh, we do language preservation. The scales are linguist. And we have just a handful of speakers left on the reservation, and they get together, and they are transcribing and translating old recordings, uh, old texts. And then also, uh, very recently, this book has come out, My Wu Yao, by uh, Mike Connolly of Campo. Did a lot of work compiling uh, all the astronomy, and this is something that we've been working with the kids on uh, through our culture camps and such. And then a, a, another big part of what we do at the museum is really work on stereotypes. Uh, what's a powwow drum? Barona has a powwow. Um, uh, there are folks that are very passionate about the powwow, but it's a Plains Indian tradition. It is not a Kumiai tradition. So don't get confused. This is a gourd rattle, and this is how 
what they would use traditionally. They sing, tell their stories. Here's an awa, here's a teepee. There are no teepees in California. Teepees are a plains tradition. You know, you would, I think you would be surprised at the number of kids that come in and we say, where are the Indians? They're dead. No, they're not. Uh, where do they live? In teepees. No, they don't. So, you know, we, we have a lot of work uh, to do to continue to educate and get rid of these stereotypes. You know, there's, everybody knows about the mascots and, you know, you're either for it or against it and it doesn't, doesn't really matter at this point as long as we know that this is what Kumeyaay people look like. This is not their culture. This is. And one thing I talk to kids about is look at all the skin tones. Can you tell an Indian by looking at them? No. Nope. They don't look like this. So I ask you, what does an Indian look like in your mind's eye? You know, are we, what are the stereotypes we're dealing with? What are the biases? Everybody has biases. It's human. You can't get away from it. That's why I have this word up here, the amygdala. Mm -hmm. The amygdala in your brain is your fight or flight uh, thing that fires, right? And so when it's firing, you have to say, is that true for everybody? Is it true just this one time? You know, if I were to walk down the street in Gaslamp and there's a big burly guy with tattoos on his face, my amygdala's firing, right? Is that true? Is that guy dangerous? Are all guys with face tattoos dangerous? Or is it maybe just one? <laughs> right? So, but this is, even if you were to work really hard and get rid of that bias, another one would take its place. We're human. And so I just uh, would encourage you to think about that. And, you know, if you hear people talking about the Indian, you know, you can help, uh, help me do my job. Mm -hmm. So another thing we've been working on is uh, putting the creation story in print. And something Ashley helped us do. Thank you, Ashley. Um, we received a grant, and we were able to mine all these ethnographic records that existed all over the United States. You know, why they're in Indiana, I don't know. Um, but they should be here. And so we pulled all that stuff, wrote the creation story. Because whose history gets remembered? The ones that, when it's written, right? When you can look at it and read it. So now, this is written, uh, thanks to a grant we got. Every tribal member has a copy. Every household has a copy. And what good is it? What's it for? Right? We're, we're always working with the people to uh, fight assimilation. Uh, they weren't supposed to be here right now. Uh, their ways have been made foreign to them. Uh, and what happens when you don't know your, your identity? Like, you know, we see all these uh, ancestry commercials and everybody wanted to know where they came from. It's because we've all been assimilated, right? They have something very special that they should know uh, from where they come. It's important, we want to bolster that identity. We want to combat intergenerational trauma. Uh, they want to preserve their ways, uh, it's their knowledge from their creator, and we would like for everybody to acknowledge that it's an equal and valid way of knowing things about our world. Uh, you don't have to agree with it, but we would hope that you would acknowledge it's just as valid as another way of thinking. Uh, and with that, thank you very much. I am happy to answer questions. Yes, sir. So how many of them are, or what percentage of them are still Catholic? You know, I don't have a good number for that, but, um, and, you know, I don't work at all 12 bands. I don't have a good read on the other reservations. At Barona, the old folks are very Catholic. Uh, it's, uh, it, they're very Catholic. I think the, the next generations who have been exposed to some of this work and growing up in different times have kind of come away from the church. So they, do they still have a Catholic church? Yeah, um, there's, okay. yeah, that church still exists, yeah, and they have mass every day. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. One of the, one of the hallmarks of contact uh, in the 15th century was rampant disease among uh, the American peoples. And I wonder if, if by the, the 18th century, that still was a factor when the first Spanish uh, colonists arrived and established the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's not a whole lot of records about that, but we know that the Spanish came in, you know, they changed the plants, they changed the animals, they didn't have access to their, their remedies, um, and, you know, all those brand new diseases, um, yeah, was not good. 
Sorry. And do they have like depictions or hieroglyphs that depict where their god came from or anything like that? Yeah, so there's much more to that story, and I want to make sure that you understand that that was just a high level, you know, 30,000 view. Um, they, they know the place. Uh, it's out east around Yuma, uh, that that's where creation happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sir? Yeah, you were showing a large area where they used to live. Uh, Viejas, is this a part of that? Okay. Uh, so they lived uh, where the water or the reservoir is now. Uh, there was the Capitan group that lived on this side, and then the Los Conejos <coughs> group that lived on the other side. And then there was another family, kind of a displaced native family. So there were three groups living in that space. The Capitan group are the only ones that were going to be affected by the reservoir. They were down lower, they lived lower, and the other groups were a little bit, they weren't going to be affected. So the, the government was working with the Capitan group to move to Barona, and then the Los Conejos group said, well, hey, what about us? We need to move. We don't want, you know. And a lot of that money that was supposed to go to Barona was diverted to the Los Conejos group, and that's what became Viejas. So in actuality, they were supposed to build 30 homes at Barona, uh, one for each family, and they ended up only building 16. I mean, they ran out of money. So between 1932 and 1934, 16 homes and the church and the cemetery were built. Anybody else? Yes. So are other tribe or like other uh, reservations like Pala or Rincon are they all related? Uh, that's a completely different language stock. Uh, they not related at all. And so there's there's varying theories and paradigm. You know, uh, it depends on who you ask. They'll say that they've been here forever. Um, but if you look at how language moves across the the language, the linguistic evidence is that they've come west and kind of spread out and isolated uh, this linguistic group from their kin in the north. Um, I can talk more about that with you after we can chat online or offline. Yeah, they're, um, so out into the desert, like all the Serrano, the Cahuilla, they're all the same language group, and it's just Kumeyaay into uh, like the bottom of the Grand Canyon. So all the people that end with pie, walla pie, have a soup pie, pie pie, all of those folks are related linguistically. So how big a population is the people? Uh, 500-ish. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes? So in your linguistic um, the slide that you had earlier with the linguist and the yeah. native, um, are they translating a, a verbal language to paper? Yes. So it was all, it was sung and whatever passed down verbally. Right. There was a linguist prior to our current linguist, but she has passed on and, and, our, and our linguist was her understudy. And so that first linguist is the one that developed the alphabet and that's how I can write epi and awa and have that glottal mm -hmm. stop, that funny mm -hmm. sound. Um, so there is a written, lang written alphabet now so that we can translate and transcribe, but it was not a written language. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Your reference to the the mastodon, one hundred thirty thousand years ago. Yeah. Is that what you were saying? That uh, I mean, that's pretty different from the theory of the land bridge, uh, the Bering Straits, which is roughly thirteen thousand. Isn't that uh -huh. uh, yeah. what the general theory of anthropology is about when people migrated? And I think that that has been kind of thrown out the window over uh, the last several years. The I studied that the as an undergrad. Has been thrown mm -hmm. out the window. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Huh. So no and what's the new theory? Um, 130 is pretty well, long. <laughs> That's a lot um, <laughs> Because I work for Barona and I'm here on behalf of Barona. I've been <laughs> okay. here since the beginning. All right. Gotcha. All right. <laughs> 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 well, we can chat. So uh, thank you all. I hope it wasn't too awful. Oh, yeah. So. Um, have a raffle ticket. I brought prizes for listening. I had to incentivize this somehow. Um, and again, Ashley, your work lives on. Ashley had these bags created for us. <laughs> oh, good, Ashley. Oh, we miss Ashley.